So, I think I want to spend a little bit of time here to talk about what's actually involved in sending a spacecraft to Mars. Um, we'll be talking about this home and transfer orbit, which is the least energy pathway that we use to uh, send spacecraft to Mars. Not only the robotic spacecraft now, but well, uh, we may tweak it a bit for human spacecraft for human spaceflight. Uh, Kepler's laws will rear their ugly head again. Um, Kepler's laws have not gone away, even though Kepler discovered them centuries ago. They still govern the way objects move in orbit around the sun, and so. Um, this will be hopefully a nice refresher as well. Yeah, uh, given the time we've got, I won't take the time to go to this site. Uh, maybe I'll pull it up quickly at the beginning of next lecture. But uh, this is a nice, uh, uh, a nice um, animation which shows you Earth and Mars uh, in um, the <coughs> orbit around the sun and basically gives you an idea of what the relative size of Mars is at these different uh, orientations. Uh, so it's well worth looking at, but I just don't want to take the time to do it here. So I'll skip this movie. So if we go back to look at the orbital parameters of Earth and Mars, uh, I'm not going to uh, clearly go through all of this stuff, but if we remember Kepler's third law, it related the time a planet takes to go around the sun to the distance of the or, you know the distance away from the sun that that planet orbits so in general planets that have are further out from the sun that have bigger orbits are going to take longer to go around the sun that's because they have a longer distance to go but also it's because they're moving more slowly Mercury has a much higher orbital velocity than Jupiter and a much shorter path. Therefore, you would expect that the time it takes for Mercury to go around the sun is going to be a lot shorter than the time it takes Jupiter to go around the sun. But Kepler's law did more than just that general, oh, if you're further out, it takes you longer, kind of. Kepler came up with a precise mathematical relationship between those that Newton later explained in terms of his universal law of gravitation. So in Kepler's third law, it says that the cube of the distance measured as the semi-major axis is going to be equal to the square of the time it takes to go around, which is kind of arcane. I don't know of any way to make that intuitive for you uh, other than telling you to memorize that it's the cube, you take the distance and cube it, and that's going to be proportional to the square value. You know, if you take the time and square it, those two things are going to be proportional. And if you scale it in terms of Earth years and the distance of Earth from the sun, that's a one to one relationship. So if we look at, um, if we look at the Oops, let's get a pen here. If we look at how far away Mars is from the sun in terms of Earth distances from the sun, astronomical units, and the time it takes Mars to go around the sun compared to the time it takes the Earth to go around the sun. So Mars takes 1.88 Earth years to go around the sun, and it is 1.5 Earth distances, astronomical units, further out from the sun. So if you take that 1.524, the distance, and you cube it, you get 3.5, something, something, something. And then if you take the square root of that, you come up with 1.88, which is, voila, the, uh, the, the time it takes Mars to go around the sun. So this works for all the planets. It works for comets going around the sun. You know, anything that goes around the sun in orbit. Well, when we send a spacecraft from one place to another, 
from one planet to another, what are they orbiting? The sun. So spacecraft should obey Kepler's third law as well, as well as obeying the first law and the second law. Okay. So first, how not to go to Mars. This diagram shows Earth and Mars when they are closest to each other, and what is that arrangement called? No, the other one, opposition. Okay, so it's called opposition again because if the sun is in the center here, Mars and the sun are on opposite sides of the sky from the Earth. Okay, so at opposition, Earth and Mars are closest that they're ever going to be. Why don't we just take off at that point and go straight to Mars? Because it takes time to get from Earth, <coughs> from Earth to Mars, and yeah. by then they wouldn't be at that same position. Yeah, by the time the spacecraft got there, it's going to be move much slower than the planets. Mars is not going to be there anymore. Earth is not going to be there anymore. And you've just wasted... Uh, $457 million because your space probe is nowhere that you want it to be. Plus, this is, this is too simplistic as well because the space probe, when it takes off from the Earth, is not, it's not starting from standing still. How fast is the space probe going and in what direction? It's on the Earth, so it's going as fast as the Earth in the direction that the Earth is going. So you can't just point and shoot. So, can't do this. <clears throat> what you need to do instead is realize that the spacecraft that we send from one planet to the other are going to go into an orbit around the Sun. And so we want what is known as a transfer orbit that will uh, be in orbit around the sun, but in this case, we want that orbit to have its closest point to the sun be where? We're going from the Earth to Mars. What? Earth? Yeah. So we want an orbit that starts out on the Earth, goes around the sun, and at its high point away from the sun, where does that need to be? At Mars. Okay. So uh, this is going to be what kind of a shape? What's the name for that shape? Okay, which Kepler's law is that? First law, planets, comets, spacecraft, everything in orbit around the sun moves in an elliptical path. Okay. So basically, you need rocket firings at the beginning to change the orbit of the spacecraft from being on the Earth to being in this, uh, in this other orbit that's not the Earth's orbit. And then it will just coast in the orbit based on the influence of gravity until it gets out here. Then you need more spacecraft firings or you need to plunge into the Martian atmosphere. You need to some, do something to slow down so that you can match up with uh, Mars's orbit and be captured into orbit around Mars or land on Mars, depending on what you want to do. Okay, so Kepler's laws, just to recap, first one is that spacecraft and planets move in ellipses. Second one is that uh, things move fastest when they are closer to the sun. So by the time the spacecraft gets out to the orbit of Mars, it needs to be slowing down. And then this third one that you know, none of you like is what actually determines when our launch windows are. So the spacecraft is going to have an orbit, and that orbit is going to have a semi-major axis that will be the distance to the sun, and it will have an orbital period. And so we can calculate what those are based on Kepler's third law. So there's a little math here, but it's pretty straightforward. You know, if the spacecraft is going from the Earth 
which has a radius r1 away from the sun, and it's going out to Mars, which has a radius of r2. And so if, if, if the Earth is one astronomical unit away from the sun, and Mars is 1.5 astronomical units away from the sun, then the average orbital distance for our probe is going to be 1.25. So that becomes our A. You know, at this point, it becomes just plugging in the math. If you take A, that 1.26, and cube it, you get not 3.5 like we did for Mars, but 2.0. And if you take the square root of that, you get 1.4 years. That's how long it would take the probe to take off from Earth, get into this orbit, loop around the sun, and come back. But that's not what we want it to do. We want it to go out halfway to Mars. So the actual transport time to Mars for this low energy orbit, this Hohmann transfer orbit, this ellipse, is on an average 8.5 months. If you want to send a rocket to Mars, a spacecraft to Mars, using the least amount of energy possible, you're going to put it in this coasting orbit that's going to take it 8.5 months to get there. 8.5 months out in space, and then, voila, you then arrive at Mars. Okay, so thank you, Kepler. Okay, you did this all a couple centuries ago. We can still use it today. <coughs> The reason why we have launch windows, though, is we don't want the probe just to get to the orbit of Mars. We want the probe to get to the orbit of Mars when Mars is there. Right? Doesn't do our probe any good to arrive here at the orbit of Mars if Mars is over here. So we want the probe and Mars to both show up here at this point at the same time, which means we have to figure out where is Mars going to have to be in its orbit when we're launching for us to both end up at the same place? Well, it takes us 8.5 months to get there. Mars takes 1.88 years to go 360 degrees around the sun. So 0.7 years divided by 1.88 years is a little less than half of uh, Mars's orbit around the sun. So it actually ends up to be 135 degrees. So if this is the rendezvous point, we have to launch from Earth when Mars is 135 degrees away from that rendezvous point. Which means we launch missions when the Earth is coming up to overtake Mars, but before opposition, uh, before um, uh, before opposition. So this would be a couple of you know. Actually, yeah. So um, within a couple of months. Well, let me just let me just phrase it this way: If Earth is here and Mars is a little bit ahead of us in its orbit, and we launch. Within a couple of months, <clears throat> Mars is going to get to be here, and Earth will be here, and uh, we'll be in opposition, but at, the, at, at that time, the probe is going to be on its way. And then over time, uh, that eight and a half months later, about six months after opposition, uh, the probe will have gotten to that rendezvous point in Mars's orbit. Mars will have gotten to that rendezvous point in Mars' orbit, and you can do whatever you need to do to capture the probe into orbit around Mars. You either fire some rocket engines, or like I say, you can break by going into the atmosphere and using the resistance of the atmosphere to slow down. In the meantime, the Earth will have moved around, and because it's going faster and on a shorter, or on a shorter stack uh, path, it's going to be, you know, so after eight and a half months, it's going to be almost around to here in its orbit. So to start off with, you start off with Earth here, Mars here, you launch. Eight and a half months later, Mars and your spacecraft arrive here at the rendezvous point, 
and the Earth is well on its way around the planet in terms of its um, orbital cycle. So we have opposition coming up uh, May 22nd, which happens to be my birthday. Yay. Um, so unexpected birthday present this year. Um, so we are now basically in getting into this kind of configuration. We are a couple of months uh, ahead of opposition. Uh, if there had not been a problem with the seismometer that the French Space Agency was providing for the Mars InSight mission that NASA wanted to launch this window, we would shortly be launching um, uh, another probe to Mars. But they had some problems with that instrument, and so we can't launch now, which means the Mars InSight mission is going to have to wait 26 months, over two years, before the next opportunity for us to, to launch it. Uh, what is going... I mean, there are some other things going this year. Um, I think uh, the European Space Agency, ESA, is sending a mission during this launch window. So we should have news about uh, a launch coming up sometime during, uh, during the course. Okay, so a little math, but it's fairly straightforward. It basically shows you <clears throat> the stuff that Kepler did, you know, two centuries ago, still allows us to plot these trajectories through space for us to get our spacecraft to Mars. If we were going to send a spacecraft to Jupiter or to Venus, <coughs> um, well, Venus, well, we would have to do something else. Um, if we're sending stuff out to the outer planets like Jupiter and so forth, uh, those orbits get more complicated because we oftentimes spend, send our spacecraft um, past other planets. So if we're sending something out to Jupiter, we might send it past Venus first to pick up some speed from the gravitational pull of Venus to sling it out to Jupiter. So it gets more complicated. It's a whole series of, of uh, you know, mini elliptical orbits that have to be calculated. But basically, during coast phase, whenever anything is coasting and not being either propelled by propellant in a spacecraft burn or being pulled along by the gravity of a planet during a gravity assist procedure, every all the other time, uh, basically, the um, planets, uh, the spacecraft is going to be go looping around in an elliptical orbit, driven by the gravity of the sun. 